I could just ask folks to uh, please take a seat and feel more than free to come forward. We don't have to be that Catholic. You can come to the front. We're really delighted to uh, welcome all of you here to Mundelein Seminary, University of St. Mary of the Lake. My name is Father John Karchi. I'm the rector here at the seminary. And this, I'm proud to say, is our second annual Science at the Seminary Day. It's a new initiative that we have to try and bridge the sometimes widening gap, at least in people's misperception between faith and science. And Mundelein has uh, tried to address that in a number of ways in our coursework and increasingly with outreach programs such as this. We're also happy and proud to co-sponsor this event with the Newman Forum, which is a new initiative particularly geared towards high school students uh, from the Lumen Christi Institute. So please continue to watch for offerings from them, uh, some of which we'll be happy to co-sponsor with them in the city and occasionally even out here. Our speaker today is no stranger to Mundelein Seminary, Dr. Grace Wolf Chase from the Adler Planetarium. She kindly hosted us for a faith and science event down at the Adler a couple of years ago. She's been out here to speak to smaller classes of our theology students, and today we're delighted to be able to share her with the wider community. She is an associate in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago, despite her where? Well, we'll uh, correct that. But she is full-time at the Adler Planetarium and is affiliated member of the Zygon Center uh, for Religion and Science down in Hyde Park. Her primary research interests are the er studying the earliest stages of star formation in our galaxy, including how stars of all masses form in groups and clusters. She's also done extensive infrared and radio uh, observations of interstellar gas clouds. Grace is a member of the science team for the Milky Way Project, a citizen science initiative that is part of Zooniverse, uh, a wonderful uh, program that I'm sure she'll tell us more about, about how you can include, about ways to include uh, citizen scientists from all over the world in cutting edge research. Her principal outreach focus is on bringing the wonders of scientific exploration to non-traditional audiences, particularly, particularly diverse communities of faith through the Clergy Letter Project. She currently serves as Vice President of the Center for Advanced Study in Religion and Science, CSIRUS, where she helps bring the process and progress of science to seminary students and other religious scholars, such as we're having today. Grace holds bachelor's in physics from Cornell University, a doctorate in astronomy from the University of Arizona. And prior to joining Adler, she spent two years as a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at NASA Ames Research Center, and two years as a president's postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Riverside. Today, she'll be speaking to us on a journey from our cosmic origins to community building on Earth. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Grace Wolf Chase. Thank you all. I'm delighted to be here this morning, and thank you so much to Father John for inviting me to do this. So today I'm going to take you on a journey of what we might call continuing creation. Over the past few decades, we've learned a lot about how stars and planets continue to form in the universe today. And at the same time, we've discovered thousands of planet-sized worlds orbiting other stars, stars that aren't our sun. And all of these discoveries raise the question, urgently rather, of is there extraterrestrial life out there? And that question has also spawned many conversations among diverse audiences. So we'll be touching on some of those things this morning. I'm also going to tell you how you can take part in the discovery process, not just of planets around other stars, but of many different kinds of projects in both the sciences and humanities that require the participation of large numbers of human eyes, or in some cases, ears, to do research that we couldn't do without your help. So I'll be talking about a few of those things this morning. So first of all, a little bit about my background. I've been involved in star formation research since graduate school in the 1980s, and that's almost as long as this field has actually existed. A little bit more about that later. 
I've been a, an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium since 1998, and one of the exciting projects, or I should say one of the exciting types of projects that we've been able to do is involve public audiences in doing research with us in many different ways. So I thought because we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and the first moon landing this year, um, some of you in the audience may be like me, old enough to actually remember that event. Um, so I thought I'd include this photo uh, taken with two Apollo era astronauts a few years back. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, who was the second person to step on the moon, and Jim Lovell of Apollo 13 fame. Jim is actually has been a member of our board of trustees for many years. Now in his early 90s, he's still an active member, Chicago area resident. So, um, so I'd like to start by taking you on a journey out through space so we can look at some of the distances we're talking about here and examine some of the objects that I'll be talking a little bit more about this morning. So let's start with our nearest natural neighbor, the moon. The moon is about a quarter of a million miles from the Earth. And as I like to tell public audiences at the Adler, I have more than commuted this distance in the 21 years that I've worked for the Adler Planetarium. I live in Naperville. Um, so a quarter million miles is actually not all that big. Not all, not, it seems like a lot of miles, but it's drivable over the course of a lifetime, over the course of a couple of decades. So, oh dear, um, there we go, okay, no worries. So now I'm gonna take you out to the scale of our solar system. And when I talk about our solar system, I mean our sun and all the worlds that orbit around our sun. Now, I said all the worlds because we're not just talking about planets, but there are many different size objects that orbit the sun. Some things are called planets, some things are called dwarf planets, there are comets, there are asteroids, um, and of course there are the satellites or moons that orbit around the planets that orbit our sun. So if we look at this diagram here, the Earth and the sun, let me turn on. I'm gonna turn on the, this mic instead. Whoop. Okay, so if we look at, <laughs> it's playing games with me here. The distance between the sun and the earth is roughly 93 million miles. It takes light eight minutes to travel that distance. So that means if there were a huge flare on the sun at this instant, we wouldn't know about it for another eight minutes because information doesn't travel faster than the speed of light. The scale of our solar system, I'm not sure why this keeps cutting out. The scale of our solar system the diameter um, is about 10 billion miles. So now we're not talking million miles, we're talking billions of miles. If we go a little further out to what we could call the solar interstellar neighborhood, now we're talking scales not of billions of miles, but of many trillions of miles. So we use one unit of distance called the light year, Light travels about six trillion miles in one year. One light year is about six trillion miles. So you're looking at some of the stars fairly close to the sun within about 30 light years of the sun here. Now, for most of their lives, lives and bunny ears here, stars uh, are powered by nuclear reactions deep in their cores that fuse hydrogen into heavier elements. And they can do that for millions or billions, or in the case of some stars, trillions of years. 70% of all the stars out there are stars we call red dwarfs. These are stars that are intrinsically uh, much fainter than our sun. And by that I mean if you could line up a red dwarf and our, our sun at the same distance. Red dwarf stars are tens of thousands of times to a hundred thousands of times dimmer. But they're ubiquitous. Most of the stars out there are red dwarfs. The stars you see in the night sky aren't because red dwarfs are very faint. So when you look out at the sky at night, 
Think about the fact that you're seeing not necessarily the nearest stars, but some of the brightest stars. Now, the rarest stars are luminous blue stars that we call O and B stars that can be tens of thousands to 100,000 times brighter than our sun. Now, these stars are very rare. There are none in the solar interstellar neighborhood. I don't know why this keeps cutting out. Sorry about that. Um, there are none in the solar neighborhood, but these bright stars are stars that at the end of their lifetimes, once they fuse um, sequentially heavier elements, they explode and they distribute those heavy elements back into space. So they're very important because they seed interstellar space with heavy elements that are necessary for things like life. Now we can go out to a larger scale and hopefully people can see this fairly well. Our sun is one of roughly 400 billion stars in a large group of stars we call the Milky Way galaxy. Now, this is the way we see, I don't know why that's happening. This is the way we see our Milky Way from the inside, from our position orbiting uh, the center of our galaxy, orbiting around our sun, which is located kind of in the suburbs of our galaxy, about halfway out from the center to the outskirts to the rural area of our galaxy. So we never see our galaxy like this. We never actually see our galaxy like this because it's about 100,000 light years in diameter. So we have to infer its shape by making measurements from where we are in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, 100,000 light years is roughly 600 quadrillion miles, mind-boggling. So remember that when we look out into space, we're also always looking back into time. We never capture now. We have a record of, of the history of things in the cosmos as we look further and further out into space. Now I want to point out quickly, because we'll be talking about this more in a little bit, Maybe I just won't use the laser pointer. Uh, there's a dark ridge down the center of the Milky Way. How many people have seen the Milky Way in the night sky from a dark place? Good, that's what I like to see. Bunch of hands going up there. Um, from Chicagoland, you can't see the Milky Way. But when we look at the Milky Way, we're looking into the plane of our galaxy. And that dark rift is not the absence of stars but it's places in the plane of our galaxy that are filled with huge, cold, dusty clouds that block the light from stars embedded within in the plane of our galaxy. Now we're gonna go out a little bit further to our next nearest spiral galaxy neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, on a clear, moonless fall night. If you look up in the constellation of Andromeda, you might notice a little fuzzy patch of light you won't see it like this, even with a small telescope, but that fuzzy little patch of light is the only thing outside of our galaxy that you can see with the unaided eye um, in the northern hemisphere. That little smudge is the Andromeda galaxy at a distance of about two and a half million light years. Now that galaxy and our galaxy and other galaxies and what we call the local group are gravitationally bound Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy are actually approaching each other. And over a time scale of billions of years, they're expected to merge. Now, far distant future, and when galaxies merge, stars don't collide. Because an individual star may be about a million miles in diameter, but the spacing between typical stars are trillions of miles. So kind of like grains of sand spread out. But what can happen, when galaxies merge is the gas and dust, those huge clouds that I'll be telling you a little bit more about in a minute, can get compressed and can form new stars. So let's, this is a, a beautiful image. I love these images of galaxies. These are some of my favorite. Uh, these are a handful of other galaxies that are at distances of tens of millions of light years. 
And you can see the galaxies come in different shapes, different sizes. Um, I wanted to point out the antennae galaxies. Is this happening a lot? Every time I turn around, it seems to blank out. Can you, it, it is? It, it's random because I'm seeing it here. I need to turn around to be able to see what's going on. Um, so the antenna galaxies are actually galaxies that are in the process of merging now. And when I say in the process of merging now, I mean in the process of merging 63 million years ago, although merging of galaxies takes, takes a while. That's a, a very long process. So I wanted to point out all of this dark stuff that you see here. Those are these giant, what we call molecular clouds um, in these galaxies. And these bright little fuzzy blips that you see here in the Whirlpool galaxy and also in the antennae galaxies are hot clouds of hydrogen that are lit up by some of these very luminous stars, stars that are tens, 100,000 times brighter than our sun that light up the surrounding hydrogen gas. And they're kind of signposts of stellar nurseries. So I'd like to go out um, a little bit further to a famous image called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And here, you're looking at roughly 10,000 galaxies in a patch of sky that's about a tenth of the diameter of the full moon. The brightest and most well-defined galaxies are at distances of about one billion light years away. The faintest and reddest galaxies in this image are at distances of about 13 billion light years. And the universe was only about 800 million years old, 13 billion years ago. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe today, but I invite people to ask me questions later if they're interested in learning more about that. So I want to go one scale further and show you something called the Hubble Legacy Field which is roughly the size of the full moon on the sky. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. In this field of view, there are roughly 265,000 galaxies um, whose light, the light from some of these galaxies comes to us from about 13.3 billion years ago. In the part of the universe that we can observe, we don't know how large the universe actually is. It could be infinite. But the part of the universe we can actually observe contains roughly 10 million quadrillion stars. That's because the observable universe contains hundreds of billions of galaxies. Many of these contain hundreds of billions of stars. You multiply those two numbers together, you get a number with 22 zeros. So that's something to, to keep in mind. So I'm going to come back to Earth now and talk a little bit about some ideas that go back at least a few hundred years on how our solar system actually formed in the first place. And so first let me tell you that astronomy tends to be what we call a theory-driven science. And what we mean by this is that there were a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the things that we currently know about the universe were predicted to exist before we actually observe them based on known physics, based on known science on our planet. And a beautiful example of this is the uh, origin of our solar system. Now, back in the 18th century, um, scientists had a knowledge of the way gravity works. And Newton's universal law of gravitation was used to understand the orbits of the planets. So a philosopher, uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, and a physicist, Pierre Laplace, developed a hypothesis called the nebular hypothesis, where they suggested that our solar system might have started out as a giant spinning cloud of material, of gas and dust in space, that was pulled together by gravity. And because it was spinning, it flattened out into sort of like a large pancake. And where the material was spinning slowest, the sun built up through gravity. And the planets accumulated over long periods of time in the material in this large, what we now call, protoplanetary disk. Now, that hypothesis was based on just simple knowledge of gravity and an observation that the planets lie more or less in a plane in our solar system, and they orbit the sun in the same direction. 
Now, this was an interesting idea, but I don't call it a theory because there was no way to test this hypothesis back in the 18th century. And of course, we just can't go back in time and observe the formation of our solar system. What we can do today that we couldn't do back then is do experiments within our solar system to look for clues to its origin, but we can also look to places in space where these processes are currently going on now. And so one of the things we've learned that you'll see shortly is that the birthing process of stars is far more complex, but gravity is still very important. Um, and this overall picture still sur survives. Now, um, I'd like to take you to the birth of what we what might call astrophysics. Up until the 19th century, astronomy was primarily about how things moved in space, uh, studying the orbit, studying how things moved under gravity. Um, this gentleman here, Father Angelo Secchi, a Jesuit scientist back in the 19th century, uh, is often with this cute little double entendre known as the father of astrophysics. He was the first person to devise a system of classifying stars by their spectra. So using this technique called spectroscopy, breaking apart light into its component wavelengths. And you can use a prism or a diffraction grating or various different tools to do that. And what you're looking at here are the spectra of several different types of stars. And you notice those dark lines in the spectra. Those dark lines give us critical information about the composition of the atmospheres of stars, um, and also their temperature, um, wealth of information. Now, Father Secchi at the time didn't have an important piece of physics to understand exactly how those lines are produced. That needed quantum mechanics in the 20th century, but he did recognize that those lines were related to the composition of stars. So he says, and I'd like to read this because I'm sure that people in the back can't read this, Spectral studies of celestial bodies are not aimed just at curiosity, but from them it depends the solution of many important cosmic questions. The first and the most important one is to recognize the nature of matter composing the atmosphere of the celestial bodies. Now, I also want to show you a different type of a spectrum, um, hot, clouds of elements, of atoms, um, et cetera, can produce bright line spectra as well. What I showed you before was what we call an absorption spectrum. Now, I'm showing you a bright line spectrum here. I'm also showing you how this can be represented through a graph. And the graph just depicts the brightness of those bright lines that you see as a function of wavelength. Spectroscopy breaks light apart according to its wavelength, where red light has a longer wavelength than blue light and violet light. And the reason I wanted to show you that graph is because today we use spectroscopy not just a visible light, but with telescopes that can collect infrared light and radio waves to bring us information about things that are a lot colder in space than stars are. So I'd like to take you uh, to a telescope that was instrumental in discovering a lot of molecules in what we now know as giant molecular clouds, very cold, large clouds of gas and dust in space that can be 100 light years across. This radio telescope started discovering molecules in the 1970s, and that's why I say that I've been in this field almost since the beginning. I started out in star formation about 10 years after we first started discovering the places where stars are actually born in these cold, invisible, invisible clouds. Um, so as you can imagine, if you discover molecules in space, that makes the field ripe for something called astrochemistry. Now, my background is in physics. Um, I, mostly, I study the application of physics to star formation. But there are also a lot of scientists these days that are interested and pursue research in how all of these complex molecules form in space and how they survive. So I actually used this telescope for my dissertation as a graduate student at the University of Arizona in the 1980s. 
So I'd like to take you to the mid-1980s, um, and I scared up this old newspaper article that was done on Kitt Peak, um, the telescope that I used for my dissertation. The gentleman that you see there was my graduate student advisor, and he used to take his graduate students on these 24-hour-a-day observing runs because at these radio wavelengths, the telescope can operate day and night, 24 hours a day, and we often did, um, sometimes for five or seven days running, um, and it was good to have more than one observer there because occasionally you might like to take a little cat nap um, in the, on the, the couch in the other room like my advisor is doing here in this next picture. Um, so up in the, well, I think every time I, every time I turn around, it seems to do that. So I'm pictured with another graduate student of Charlie's in the upper left there. And I wanted to show this to give you a taste of how we did things back a little over 30 years ago. So the papers that we're looking at spread over on the floor represent a radio telescope taking one spectral line of one particular molecule at one place in the sky and they're laid out in a grid to sort of follow the different positions in the sky that we had to point the telescope at to get those spectra. And then what we would do is we would make contour maps based on how bright those spectral lines were at different positions. So we would calculate the brightness of those lines and then make these contour maps. This was a very long, laborious process. And fortunately today, we can scan radio telescopes over large regions of the sky and collect data a lot much faster than we did back in the, in the 1980s. Um, so really quickly, I wanted to take you to my PhD dissertation um, entitled, uh, not maybe the most exciting uh, title here, Dense Gas in the Mon or Monoceros OB1 Dark Cloud and its Relationship to Star Formation, um, where one of the things I did for my dissertation was I studied the very densest parts of these molecular clouds, the clouds that are dense enough to actually form new stars. And when I say dense, let me tell you what I mean. A dense interstellar cloud is still about 100 trillion times less dense than air. So these are not dense by Earth standards, but they're dense enough for gravity to pull the material together to form new stars. So that blue box is about four full moons in length and about a half of a full moon across. And then that pullout is just showing you an inverted grayscale of a visible, a deep visible light photo with that squiggly contour showing really where the molecular cloud is, which is about 100 light years um, in length at this distance. So my family and I had the pleasure, or I don't know whether pleasure is the right way to describe this, of overseeing the demise of this telescope several years ago. It's been replaced with a new state-of-the-art radio telescope. Uh, my husband, you can see there in the green hat, was uh, head of operations for this telescope at the time I was doing my dissertation, and also I was operating it for other observers. And we had a very special honor. We got to actually sign a segment of the old radio telescope dish along with some of the luminaries in the field of radio astronomy since um, this telescope first started observing in the late 1960s, early 1970s. So, coming forward uh, in time, a little bit later in time, since the first detection of these interstellar molecules with radio telescopes, we've conducted many, many large surveys of the plane of our galaxy. What you're seeing there, what I hope you're seeing there, um, uh, the lower image there is actually what we call a representative color uh, uh, image uh, put together from infrared wavelengths taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. So you're looking at a small patch of sky towards the center of our galaxy, that's where that arrow is pointing, uh, towards the summer constellation of Sagittarius. This is part of a much larger image that stretches most of the way around our galaxy, around the plane of our galaxy. Um, and here, um, everything that's colorized in blue, I know you can't see it from the back, uh, but the blue background is actually a whole bunch of little blue dots. Those are all stars 
that we see looking through the dust and gas in our, our galaxy because at infrared light, at infrared wavelengths, you can peer through those dusty clouds. And there are, uh, it, it looks like a sandbox, basically. Everywhere your eye intersects a star. In contrast, the blue and green fuzzy stuff are, trace out some of these molecular clouds that I was talking about. And in fact, the greenish stuff that you're seeing there comes from emission from complex molecules, complex organic molecules we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, basically long chains of organic hydrogen and carbon atoms, long chains of molecules composed of hydrogen and carbon molecules that pervade interstellar space. And all of these observations bring us information on both the composition and the dynamics, how things move in interstellar space. So the mid-1990s saw an explosion of discoveries in astronomy, many of which occurred shortly after the Hubble Space Telescope was repaired. So at a distance of about 1,400 light years, this is the closest stellar nursery to us that's currently forming these superluminous stars I was talking about a while back, the kinds of stars that at the end of their lifetime can explode into supernovae. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image from the mid-1990s, and those little dark objects you see in, in pullouts are known as proplids for protoplanetary disks. Over the past 25 years or so, we've accumulated a lot of evidence that these are actually birthing planet, new planetary systems. Um, in the Orion Nebula, there's a cluster of stars, about 2,800 stars um, within like 20 light years of each other. Clusters of stars are very compact. We believe that when our sun was born, it had more stellar neighbors. It was born in an environment similar to this. The reason we think that is because there's evidence from studies of meteorites that a supernova exploded uh, near us at the time that our solar system was being formed. Um, so you see here that stars and planets, what we've learned is that they form in these incredibly wonderfully complex regions where it's not just about gravity, but there are things like gas pressure and turbulence and magnetic fields. And all of these things that sort of factor into what comes out of a region like this. What sorts of planetary systems do you actually wind up forming? So more recently, a year ago, these are some images of planet-forming disks that require a little bit of explanation. On the top left there, um, that was put together from radio telescopes. Um, and what you see, it kind of looks like an old record with grooves, or I should say vinyl. I guess that's the term being used these days. Um, showing gaps in the disk where there's evidence that planets are forming within those gaps. Over on the right, what you're seeing is actually visible light, but it also takes some explaining. The reason there's a black hole in the middle there is not because that's a black hole, but because the light from the star was suppressed using something called a coronagraph on the Magellan Telescope in Chile, um, and the, the light is sort of orangish. Well, that's particular light coming from hydrogen, and that little bright blip over to the right of the dark patch um, is actually a very, very young planet in this disk, in this, uh, in this protoplanetary disk. So over the past 30 years, we've put together a picture that looks something like this, of how stars and planets form together. This was put together by making many different observations at many different wavelengths and scales. Don't get caught up in the details here. But from start to finish, from the collapse of a cloud to the production of a planetary system, you're talking tens of millions of years that elapse. The initial clouds that collapse are trillions of miles across. Planetary systems tend to be more on the order of 10 billion miles across. And then stars like our sun are a million miles across. So, um, in order to build up this picture, we really needed to assemble observations of many, uh, across many different scales. Now, at the same time, but with different sets of observations over the past 30 years, we've been discovering more and more, thousands in fact, planet-sized worlds um, orbiting other stars. 
Now, we actually call those planet-sized worlds exoplanets. Um, technically, the definition of a planet includes it orbits the sun. But this is one of these cases where it's sort of a difference that makes no difference. These are planets. They're just planets that orbit other stars. We've discovered them using a number of different techniques. And let me tell you, especially young people in the audience here who might love science fiction as much as I have my entire life. Well, we've older people in the audience, too, that might love science fiction. The diversity of systems that we've been discovering rivals the imagination of science fiction writers. You have huge planets that orbit really close to their stars. You have uh, planets that orbit in systems with two or more stars, Tatooine, <laughs> um, as an example. Uh, you have mil many planetary systems where you have a string of Earth-sized planets that orbit very close to their stars. So the diversity really rivals science fiction writers. So I just want to briefly tell you about one of these techniques that has been very prolific in finding other planets called the transit technique. And this little video shows you how it works. Basically, in those cases where the system is aligned so the planet can pass across the face of its star, we don't see in, um, anything like an eclipse. But what we can measure is the small dip in the light output from that star as that planet crosses the face of its star. And you'd be amazed, and you'll see in a few minutes here, how much information we can actually get out of that. Things like planet size. With a little bit more information, we can get planet mass. Um, and even um, in upcoming observatories, information about the planet's atmosphere, if it has one. So the Kepler Observatory from 2009 to 2018 um, was one of the most prolific exoplanet finders. Um, Kepler searched basically a cone of space um, out to a distance of about 3,000 light years. Um, I'm gonna, this is sort of the outsider's view. I'm going to take you to that patch in the sky here, uh, a patch of sky in the summer, sort of just off the summer Milky Way in the constellation Cygnus. I do have a visualization that if there's time at the end, I would like to uh, run to show you, to give you a sense of the diversity of the exoplanet systems that Kepler has discovered. But I'd also like to tell you about um, an observatory that's operational now called TESS, for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Um, and you can see here those little yellow patches are the search spaces that Kepler covered during its lifetime as opposed to the blue areas, uh, which is most of the sky, that TESS is going to search. So whereas Kepler went to further distances, fainter stars, TESS's objective is to look at more nearby brighter stars and to basically search the whole sky for exoplanets. During the course of its two-year lifetime, it's expected to discover about 20,000 new exoplanets, uh, dozens of Earth-sized planets, hundreds of what we call super-Earths, which are a type of planet that has been discovered around other stars, but we don't have an example of it in our solar system. A super-Earth is basically um, a planet that's mid-range between the size of the Earth and planets like Uranus and Neptune. So in our solar system, we have four terrestrial rocky planets, and then we have four gas giants, Uranus and Neptune being the smallest. But there are a lot of worlds out there that look like they're a little bit larger than the Earth, and there's some reason to think that these may be terrestrial planets that have very large bodies of water. Within the solar neighborhood, within about 32 light years, there are nearly 100 exoplanets. The nearest one, that blip out at four light years, is a planet orbiting in what we call the habitable zone of our nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Um, a little bit more about that later, uh, what the habitable zone is. So, of course, all of these discoveries have, in the past 20 years, um, increased the number of people working in a field called astrobiology. So, in 1998, basically when I started working for the Adler Planetarium, the NASA Astrobiology Institute was first formed. And what this is, it's an organization of competitively selected teams across the country 
that carry out interdisciplinary research and student training. These days in astronomy is a very multidisciplinary field. We have physicists, chemists, biologists working together to address some of these very big questions. So astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe. And the NASA Astrobiology Institute focuses on these four areas you can see here. The origin and nature of life and coevolution with the planet Earth, uh, the habitability of early Mars and their Mars missions to explore whether there still might be exit life under the surface of Mars. There are also missions being developed uh, to go to satellites of the gas giants that are icy worlds where there is evidence of liquid, uh, large liquid bodies, underground bodies, water, um, in some cases, um, and on the surface of planet Titan or the satellite Titan that orbits Saturn, we know it has liquid methane lakes on the surface. And by the way, a good friend of mine, Brother Guy Consomagno, who did a master's dissertation at MIT in the 1970s, actually did a study and sort of first proposed that the so-called Galilean satellites of Jupiter had large liquid bodies under their surface. So um, the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico actually keeps track of what we would call the potentially habitable exoplanets. Now there's a strong caveat here. Potentially habitable does not mean inhabited. It doesn't even mean habitable. What it means at this point in time is that these are planets that are close to Earth in size, and they orbit at the right distance from their stars, where if, they, if their composition is right, the temperatures would be right for liquid water, which is essential for all life on Earth. The temperatures would be right for liquid water to exist. So a few more pieces of this puzzle will be added in hopefully in a couple of years when we launch the James Webb Space Telescope. That's going to use a technique called transit spectroscopy to actually study the atmospheres of, of exoplanets that are fairly close to the Earth and exoplanets that transit across the face of their stars. One of my, fam one of my favorite systems, exoplanetary systems, is the TRAPPIST-1 system. Now, geez, there we go. So what you see, the TRAPPIST-1 system there, the whole thing fits well within the orbit of Mercury around the sun. That's the scale that you're looking at here. Um, it's one of these sort of mini planetary systems. TRAPPIST-1 is a red dwarf star that's about 100,000 times dimmer, and a lot cooler than our sun. So, even though the furthest planet in this system takes 21 days to orbit around, three of these planets, so these planets are all very close to their star. In fact, they're so close to each other that you could see surface features from, of other planets from any of these planets. So again, fig science fiction here. And yet about three of these planets are at the right distance in this particular system where the temperatures might be right for liquid water. Um, so the idea is to, just as I showed you in Secchi's diagram there of, of studying the atmospheres of stars, as planets pass in front of their stars, if those planets have atmospheres, those atmospheres can absorb some of the light from the stars, and that can be teased out with current technology to get a handle on the composition of the, the planet's atmosphere. So now I want to take stock, step, step back briefly before I start talking about citizen science and some other things, um, and my slide here that I call knowledge and ignorance. So let's take stock of what we've learned over the past 30 years and what we don't yet know. So what we've learned is that stars and planets form together in crowded stellar nurseries. Stars cook up and disperse, the most massive stars, the ingredients, the basic elements necessary for life we found that complex organic molecules pervade space, the same stuff of life, the same organic molecules on which life is based on the Earth. The diversity of these systems is incredible. It rivals the imagination of science fiction writers. And we have discovered many Earth-sized planets at this point in time, and some of them orbit in the so-called habitable zones. 
What we don't yet know is how many planets there are that are actually habitable or inhabited, how frequently does life arise, how frequently does intelligent life develop, how frequently do civilizations develop. Now that's an important distinction. There are many intelligent species on planet Earth. We're not the only animals that are considered intelligent. We are, however, the only animals that have developed um, civilization to the extent where we communicate with symbolic language, we've developed technologies, we have the capability of searching um, the universe and asking some of these deep existential questions that differentiates us from other life on our planet. So even though we have a lot of unanswered questions, we do well to keep in mind that most of what we've learned over on the left there, we've learned over the past 30 years. What would we le learn in the next 30 years about the prospects for life? Will we have even discovered life? Many of you in this audience might be alive 30 years from now. Heck, God willing, I might even be alive 30 years from now. But one of the things we have learned is that we, we now have good reason to think that planet-sized worlds may be more abundant than stars in our universe. And there are roughly 10 million quadrillion stars in the observable universe. Now, how have we learned all of this? Well, with larger and larger teams of researchers working together, and with asking people around the world over the past decade or so, many research projects that would otherwise have been impossible to do without the help of people from all walks of life, all ages, all walks of life around the world, participating with us by looking for things in large digitized data sets, or in some cases, listening for things. So what citizen science does is it crowdsources the time and abilities of people around the world utilizing the unique human capability for spotting patterns and making new discoveries. And the types of projects that are featured on our web platform called Zooniverse are projects that human eyes are well suited to do, but human computers are not so good at recognizing those patterns yet. So what citizen scientists do is they extend the reach of what we can accomplish as professional scientists. And in turn, they take part in the process and they can claim ownership. They become part of the research teams, and they make new discoveries. So Zooniverse is the world's largest and most popular online platform for citizen science. I have a bunch of materials that you might have seen as you came in. You're free to take those. There's stickers there as well uh, for kids or for older people. And there's also a sheet of paper that describes an exciting initiative where we're actually at the Adler looking to collaborate with faith communities and interfaith communities on using some of these different projects in different classroom or youth event settings, um, as well as developing new projects. So this began modestly with a project called Galaxy Zoo 12 years ago, which was just about having people identify different shapes of galaxies. You might think computers would be good at that, no. Um, we had millions of images of galaxies. Um, when it first opened, it crashed the server because people were so eager to participate. Now we have hundreds of projects that have been developed at a given time. There are about 100 active research projects. It's no longer just about galaxies. It's no longer just about astronomy. It's no longer even just about science. If you go to the website, you will see that academic research projects um, span science and the humanities. Some of these are based on having people look at images, some looking at graphs, some looking at textual information from digitized, um, all the digitized text gleaning information from these things. So um, you can help us make new discoveries. Uh, most of the projects are best done from a computer, but there's also an app you can use on your smartphone and do a limited number of these interactions. I've highlighted two projects up here, Exoplanet Explorers and Planet Hunters Test. Believe it or not, citizen scientists are responsible for the discovery of a few dozen new exoplanets that we wouldn't have known about otherwise without their participation. Um, just last week, I have to ask this, did anybody here in the audience see the Kavli Full Dome Lecture Universe of Surprises at Adler Planetarium last week? Did anybody see this? No? 
Now, oh, this was wonderful. So um, Chris Lynn taught in, uh, at University of Oxford, and my colleague, Laura Truey at the Adler Planetarium, did a presentation in the Granger Theater, which is our large theater with 4K projectors. It was, it was absolutely incredible on some of the discoveries that citizen scientists have made working on Zooniverse. And I encourage people for this book, if this sounds at all interesting, The Crowd and the Cosmos, Adventures in the Zooniverse. It'll be published in, in um, the US in ja January 1st, so this isn't a Christmas present, unfortunately, um, but it should be a wonderful read. So, as I said, citizen scientists, most of these projects ask people to look for specific things in images, graphs, or texts. But people are curious. And very often, they spot things that, one, either we didn't think to search for, or perhaps it's something entirely new that we didn't know about. And th this is just a handful I'm highlighting here, really quickly, of some of the discoveries that were made. There are many, many, many more. Um, but citizen scientists have discovered new types of galaxies um, known as green peas. They've discovered planets, as I said, uh, dozens actually of exoplanets, of planets orbiting distant stars. That's an artist's conception there of uh, a planet that was known as Planet Hunters 1. This is really wild. It's a planet that uh, orbits two stars that orbit each other with two stars further out that orbit the entire thing. So this is a planet on a stable orbit in a system of four stars, a quadruple star system. And then my image up there is I was on the science team for the Milky Way project. It's been retired because we're working on all the data that the, uh, have been provided by the citizen scientists. It may reemerge in a new form in the future. But right now, we're publishing papers based on the discovery by citizen scientists of very young star nurseries. Stellar nurseries that are much younger than Orion and can only be seen in infrared light. So some of you may have heard, we were really excited last week, uh, Zooniverse won a Chicago Innovation Collaboration Award. And we were especially excited because across all the categories, there were only 25 winners out of more than 450 uh, nominees. So why might you think about participating with us? Well. Scientific knowledge is empowering. Citizen science helps us carry out large research projects we couldn't do otherwise. Um, and science helps us improve conditions in our communities and around the world. By participating, we learn that science is a process. It's not a dead collection of facts. And we learn best by engaging in that process. Many people of faith throughout history and today have seen learning about creation as a way of honoring God. The motto of the Vatican Observatory is Deum Creatorum Venite Adoremus. Come let us adore God the Creator. Similar sentiment was expressed by Maria Mitchell, an astronomer in the 19th century, who says, every formula which expresses a law of nature is a hymn of praise to God. And my favorite quote, or one of my favorite quotes by Goethe, Wer den Dichter will verstehen, muss den Dichters Lande gehen. Now, if your German is rusty, the English translation is the one who wants to understand the poet must walk in the poet's land. And the message is we learn about others best by participating with them in their communities, in their environments. All of these Zooniverse projects come with social media that lets you talk to the academic research teams and collaborate with other people so you get a sense of what's going on, what the project is all about, and what the results are that are coming out of that project. Um, many of you may have invited friends to come to your church communities. Um, and so you know that by doing that, your friends who might be of another faith um, learn a little bit about what your community is about. Well, we invite people to come do science with us to learn a little bit about what science is all about. So finally, we're coming to the last part of my talk, um, which is that, of course, all of these new discoveries, science is really good at answering a lot of how does this work kind of questions. But it's also good at raising questions that science itself is not equipped to address very well. 
questions of a religious nature, and questions of an ethical nature. A lot of those questions that begin with should rather than can. So as an example of some of the questions raised by the ever-growing possibility of the existence of extraterrestrial life, that's what ETL stands for, by the way, how would the discovery of extraterrestrial life affect our religious beliefs? How should we regard extraterrestrial life? How should we think about it if we do find it? How should we protect life on Earth? And now I don't just mean protecting Earth from aliens, but I mean protecting the diversity of life on Earth. Because at present, at least at present, there's only one world where we know for sure has life, and, that, and that's Earth. How should we protect extraterrestrial life from life on Earth, should we find extraterrestrial life? And finally, we're on the verge of putting a human presence on Mars. And one of the questions that that raises also, not just ethical questions about extraterrestrial life, but how should we go about exploring space in a manner equitable to all? As I'm sure you all know, colonization in the past has resulted in benefits for a few select people and groups, often at the cost of great um, great tragedy for other groups of people. Um, so my colleague at the Adler, Lucianne Walkowitz, spent a year working at the Library of Congress thinking about some of these questions and started a decolonizing Mars initiative. And by that she doesn't mean we shouldn't ever go to Mars, but we need to think very carefully about how we do so in a way that works for all peoples on Earth, not just a select few. So, as a, as a start to addressing some of these questions, there's a book that I highly recommend to anybody who might be interested in this topic called Astrotheology, Science and Theology Meet Extraterrestrial Life. This book has chapters written by scientists, theologians across the Abrahamic traditions, ethicists, historians. Um, it's a wonderful compendium of different perspectives. It's edited by a friend of mine, Lutheran theologian Ted Peters, who works at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences at Berkeley. And I want to quickly read this quote and then go on. I have a few more slides, and then we can take questions. So Ted writes, astrotheology is that branch of theology which provides a critical analysis of the contemporary space sciences combined with an explication of classic doctrines such as creation and Christology for the purpose of constructing a comprehensive and meaningful understanding of our human situation within an astonishingly immense cosmos. Theologians and religious intellectuals should cooperate with leaders of multiple religious traditions and scientists to address ethical issues associated with space exploration and to prepare the public for the eventuality of extraterrestrial contact. To give you a taste of some of the provocative and interesting questions this book explores, in one of the later chapters, Ted writes a couple of chapters where he muses about a possible way of thinking about engaging with extraterrestrial life, especially extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, I want to emphasize this is not the only way to think about this, but I think it really underscores the way human beings tend to think of importance. So Ted puts extraterrestrial life in three categories less advanced or intellectually inferior than humans, suggesting we might think about those the same way we think about non-human species on Earth, intellectual peers of humanity, suggesting we might treat them as our equals, and then intellectually superior to humans. And he has an interesting take on this where he suggests we might think about a biblical slave ethic, um, as in 1 Peter 2.18, Slaves accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. And I think Ted was trying to be a little provocative here. Um, we might not even be able to assess where extraterrestrial intelligence falls on this spectrum. We may not even be able to, to really understand that. Um, but again, it does shed some light on where we put importance, but it's also a slippery slope because there are mature members of several species on Earth that are more intelligent than either very young human beings or severely disabled human beings. So this is, this is really a very slippery slope. 
So Ted asked me and several others to respond to some of the content in this book um, by writing articles for the journal Theology and Science, which is a journal out of the Berkeley Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. And I sort of um, wrote an article, I wrote an article sort of exploring the fact that I think good science fiction provides fertile ground to nurture dialogue between science, philosophy, ethics, and theology by beginning with what is, envisioning what might be, and then exploring what should be. Um, and in particular, I think a lot of science fiction kind of serves as modern day parables. And here's an example. Now, most of you people, I'm looking at it, a lot of young faces don't remember the Twilight Zone, but there was a classic, famous Twilight Zone episode in 1962 called To Serve Man, where these superior aliens came to Earth purportedly to share their technology um, in, with human beings. And they brought along this book titled To Serve Man. Well, by the end of the episode, we learn that this is actually a cookbook. So here's a question. Would a slave ethic include going willingly to be slaughtered? And I don't mean that just tongue in cheek. Um, as you may know, there are more and more people on our planet, especially among millennials, that are going vegetarian or vegan um, for both ethical and environmental reasons. So th th just something to think about. I am not giving you any answers here. I'm just giving you some things to think about. So in this book also, planetary scientist Chris McKay comes up with this astroethical premise. The long-term goal of astrobiology is the enhancement of the richness and diversity of life in the universe. Well, right now, again, we know of only one planet that has life, and that's Earth. Um, and about 99% of the mass extinctions on Earth today have been attributed to human behaviors. Um, and what does that say about how good we've been at stewarding the Earth? Now, there are those that argue, um, both from without and from within the Christian community, that Christianity is anthropocentric. I would say that Christianity is God-centered or Christ-centered. And if we look to Christ as the model of what responsible dominion should look like on Earth, we see responsibility, service, and compassion, not exploitation. So I think that considering the possibility of extraterrestrial species motivates us to reevaluate humanity's history as stewards of Earth and to examine critically human behaviors before migrating to other worlds. So a few reflections and questions. Um, a few of the things, well, what I've been involved over the past 20 years in conversations between scientists and theologians that seek what we might call creative mutual interaction. How can some concepts developed um, in science and how can some concepts developed by religious thinkers maybe talk to each other and make, provide for fruitful ways of thinking about things? Well, one of the things that we have learned over the years is that the universe is fertile. It has produced incredible diversity from starting with very simple beginnings. And that idea has been used by theologians to, the, that observation has been used to develop ideas on how creation may participate in God's creativity. We've also learned that the universe is interactive and relational. So this book here, now this book, unlike the other two that I told you about earlier, is a little bit more highly academic. I don't recommend it for bedtime reading. This book, we had seminary students in mind, uh, but for interested public audience, I think the book is also appropriate, called Interactive World, Interactive God. And it explores this idea that everything we've learned about the universe suggests that the universe is about how things interact and relationship between things. That the universe is almost more like a giant organism than it is like a mechanism, a collection of things. It's a collection of relationships. And I kind of wonder um, how this observation might provide inspiration for creative mutual interaction in various different ways. For example, people who explore the concept of relationality in, in Trinitarian theology. So that's for the seminarians out there to think about. So question raised by the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the reality of human space exploration are urgent. And they call for conversations across and insights from 
diverse communities, diverse religious communities, not just scientists, diverse cultures around the world. So finally, I want to end on um, the question that a lot of people think about, maybe. Um, will comparative religion with extraterrestrial intelligence ever be possible? Um, certainly during my lifetime, there have been in Voyager, in, in spacecraft that have been sent out far into space. There have been assumptions made on uh, that other civilizations might actually be able to understand us through some of our scientific concepts. Well, I think people with background in linguistics and semiotics would say it's not quite that simple. Um, any of you see the science fiction movie Arrival? Arrival, yeah, okay, some people have. Um, well, that was a great movie, I think, to highlight some of the potential difficulties in trying to communicate through symbolic language. But this is a question that has nonetheless been thought about, and it was thought about by a woman named Alice Maynall, a Roman Catholic mother of eight and prominent suffragette in the early 20th century, and um, she envisioned communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence before the first pulp science fiction about travel to another planetary system, she wrote this beautiful poem called Christ in the Universe. And I think I won't read the whole poem right now out loud, but I will say that there are people in today's society that are very fearful of the discovery of extraterrestrial life and what that might do um, to Earth's religions. That's not the way Alice Maynall saw it at all. Um, this poem stands in stark contrast to thinking anthropocentrically. She found the idea of sharing religious experiences with other civilizations exciting and wonderful, and her poem reflects a faith rooted in mystery and standing in awe of a God truly beyond all human understanding. Thank you. Great questions. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dr. Wolf Chase, for an amazing presentation. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so for questions and answers. Now we're putting some microphones down either aisle. I'll just ask that you come up to the mic to pose your question. And a reminder that immediately following that, uh, seminarians will be leading a small group discussions. I think you got some information on which group you're in as you came in. If you haven't been uh, assigned to a group, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, but that'll be happening out in the lobby, and then you'll go off to various classrooms uh, on the campus. Thank you, sure. Really, I, and I welcome any kinds of questions. It doesn't even necessarily have to be about the material that I've talked about here today. I'll do my best. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, a pair of questions. Sure. Maybe for this forum. How does looking at the universe guide us and inform us as we're trying to know God? And how does our faith tradition inform us and guide us to forming hypotheses about the nature of the universe? So, Something like quantum entanglement, communion of saints. Yeah. Uh, so, two ways. So, so first of all, I don't think you get to know the person of God through science. I think that that would do a disservice both to science and to faith, uh, because science only deals with a limited subset of, of, of questions. But as my friend Brother Guy is fond of saying, um, I think science gives us a flavor in, in a sense of the personality of God, how things work, how things, how things happen. And one of, the, one of the things that I think that we've learned in exploring the immensity of the universe, it should make us more humble, and it should be a cautionary note not to try to put God in a box and force God to confine, or, or force God, confine God to our, for lack of a better way of expressing this, because I'm a scientist, not a theologian, uh, force God to conform to our models of God. Um, I think that, um, you know, a model of something is an imperfect, um, well, an imperfect model. <laughs> it's an imperfect understanding. It's the way we think about something that helps us. But to substitute that 
for the underlying reality is a form of idolatry, right? Um, in, in a sense, because you're, you're, you're saying that this, this model that I have, this is the reality. And I think that we need to be humble in our conversations and the way we think about things. Now to the other part of your question about this creative mutual interaction, yes, there are people that talk about um, quantum entanglement and all of these different, uh, different things. There, there are people who, who, who look to try to understand how God might work in a universe governed by by mathematical laws, for, for lack of a better way of, of putting that. Let, let me clarify I, that. In the, in the, through faith and through our spiritual tradition, we have uh, a concept about God, you know, being timeless, all-powerful, ever-present. Yeah. And how could that help us hypothesize about God's creation? Uh, you know, we just discovered things like quantum entanglement or, uh, you know, Big Bang. Uh, one of the assumptions is that matter requires space, but there was a point in time where huge amounts of matter required almost no space. Well, okay, so um, the understanding is kind of that space and time as we know it began with the Big Bang. Now, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be other Big Bangs or there couldn't be even other universes out there, but space and time as we measure them began with the Big Bang. And it's interesting that you bring that up because the person who's known as the father of the Big Bang, Georges Lemaitre was a Belgian priest, and he was accused at the time by some people in the scientific community who wanted to think of the universe as everlasting, as, as always having been there, of letting his religious faith sort of dictate his ideas about things. Um, and at the same time, the, the Pope at the time kind of glommed on to that as, oh, this is, this is great. This is, um, you know, this kind of is a validation, or I, I, I don't want to put words in the Pope's mouth, but a validation of the, the Catholic faith that the universe actually had a beginning. Lemaitre was sort of horrified by both, and his response was that he doesn't see how a scientific theory like this could really have metaphysical implications. And he pointed to scriptural, to scripture, like um, scripture in Isaiah, that speaks of the hidden God, hidden even in the beginning of creation. Um, and that our science just really isn't good enough to flesh that out. Now, the other side of the coin is really interesting to me but I don't see it happening very much yet, where ideas that theologians and philosophers have had for, and talked about for many, many years, where that actually informs the way we think about some things in science. I would like to see more of those kind of discussions. Most of what I've been privy to over the past couple of decades has been more along the lines with, well, this is what the science has shown us, and then we get together and we talk, and theologians reflect on how that might influence theological thinking. So it, it has been a bit of a one-way street, but it doesn't have to stay that way at all, and I think that there's more and more interest in how some of these deep um, religious ways of thinking about some of these issues might inform or might, might inspire the science into new directions. Looking for good questions to ask, good hypotheses to test. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes? First, first of all, I want to say thank you for the excellent lecture. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, I went through the Vatican website, and I was trying to see if there was any official uh, church position with respect to, um, to uh, uh, ECCLs. And so, so I went through the encyclicals, I went through yeah. the, the bulls, I saw nothing, but I noticed that the Vatican does have what's known as a, uh, a Vatican uh, observatory. And so I was yeah. wondering, you know, what is the Vatican's position, number one, and what is the purpose of the uh, observatory? Is it like the equivalent of a SETI? Okay, uh, a couple of things. First of all, a disclaimer, I'm Lutheran. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm perhaps not the best person to speak to the Catholic perspective on this. However, 
Uh, my good friend, Brother Guy, the Vatican is part of the, he's actually the director of the Vatican Observatory. Um, several years ago, he wrote a little uh, teaching book. I can't remember what these are called, but uh, they have these little books with Catholic teaching. And he wrote specifically on, and he's written specifically on things like extraterrestrial life. In fact, he co-published a book several years back called Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial and Other Questions from the Observer's Inbox at the Vatican Observatory. <laughs> Long title, it is a great book. It's a dialogue between him and a priest exploring some of these questions. Um, and you know, long story short, we can't limit the creativity of God. Uh, we can't speak to how many other civilizations, how many other creatures God relates to in different ways. Uh, but so uh, that, that's what I can offer as far as the church or the Pope having some sort of official position. I don't know, maybe Father Karchi. <laughs> um, is he in the audience here still? Uh, there might be people in this audience that could address that better than I can. Yeah. Yes. I suspect, like you, I grew up um, reading science fiction and dreaming of uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. And it seems like in the last 30 years or so, the physics of that happening with the discovery of, of the hard evidence of, of uh, exoplanets strengthens that vision. But also at the same time, Fermi's paradox that if there are these yeah. civilizations, where are they? Why don't we see them? Um, seems to me as strong an argument against their existence as it ever has been. So I just want to know if you care to make any yeah, comments on so that. So that's interesting. So the gentleman brings up an observation that was noted by a physicist, University of Chicago physicist, Enrico Fermi, um, at a luncheon back in like 1950 with other scientists where he did some back of the envelope calculations and figured out that given the age of the universe, the galaxy, that there should have been enough time for technological civilizations to arise and actually cover interstellar distances as, you know, as mind-boggling as they are. Um, and we should have some, some kind of, a, of, of, of evidence that they're out there. Um, and he posed that as a, as a paradox. Um, there are so many different possible solutions to that. I could, couldn't even start to detail all of them, not the least of which that civilizations get to around of where we are today and then they destroy themselves. I mean, that's the most, that's one of the most uh, depressing um, ways, ways of thinking about some of these things. Um, so we don't know, but the, the thing is, the, the more, as we conduct more and more of these searches, and it, the rise in discovery of exoplanets, the rise in development of technologies has been exponential. We're on that rapidly rising exponential part of the curve there. So I think 10, 20 years down the road, we'll be in a better position to answer that question because it, it makes many, Fermi's paradox makes many assumptions about the types of life, what that life might choose to explore, um, you know, for all we know, civilizations might turn inward and not explore the way we do. Um, so that's kind of a question that first, I think the first steps are what we can do is explore nearby planetary systems and see how habitable some of those systems might be, any sort of life there whatsoever. Um, one thing that is interesting, if we were to find subsurface life on one of the icy moons of the outer planets, for example, another genesis of life within our solar system, that would be pretty powerful evidence that at least simple life is all over the place in the universe. Um, it's still, the still question, the question that's still out there is, are there other civilizations like us that reflect on some of these things? So that's an open question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for your remarks this morning. Um, I'm a researcher and digging a lot into the work of um, the Jesuit Terre de Chardin, 20th century, and then sort of all of these. There's a stream of thinkers following. I think most prominently is Elia Delio, who's a Franciscan sister. Um, and, and she argues that 
you know, theology, underneath theology, we have a cosmology. And of course, you know, the, the human authors of scripture were writing out of a very different cosmology, uh, you know, uh, because of, they had to, just given, given where they were, sort of the heaven and the earth and the underworld. And, um, and so I think my, how would you begin to answer the question of, um, well, do you agree with the prop? Oh, cut out, okay. Uh, how do you begin with Delia's prep, uh, you know, proposal that we need a new cosmology in order to build a new theology? And then how do you begin you to know, think about reading I, scripture in light of this? I, actually, you know, that's interesting. I think what we need is a better understanding and for people to have a better understanding of the whole context of the script. I, I don't want to see Genesis 1 rewritten with modern day cosmology because Lord knows what cosmology is going to look like 50 or 100 years from now. Our, our pictures of the universe change our understanding of cosmic reality. The setting, yes, use the cosmology of the day to introduce the very profound thought that God is the source of all of this, regardless of how it came to be. Um, and, you know, you start rewriting things and changing things. I mean, uh, you lose something. You lose something very precious about the way people were thinking about things and where they were placing importance. Science as we know it today is just a few hundred years old. The term scientist was actually only coined in the 1800s by William Wewell, and in fact, he coined that term to describe a scientist named Mary Somerville, who was a scientist, astronomer, mathematician, etc. There wasn't a term for that. Um, so the term natural philosopher and scientist kind of coexisted for a while, and today we refer to natural philosophers as scientists. But, you know, if you look at scripture, I mean, I think that the early, um, the early church was wise in preserving texts that on the surface look like they contradict each other. As you're all probably aware, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 present very different creation stories, and there are more to be found in the Psalms and other places in the Hebrew scriptures, um, but they tell us profound things, right? Genesis 1 gives us a view of a transcendent God, a God that calls things into creation by God's word, um, and Genesis 2 gives us a picture of an imminent God who works there in and with creation. So, you know, I, I know that there are efforts to, like, say, retell the cosmology, but I think it's better to understand that the Genesis stories really aren't about cosmology. They're about God's relationship to the created order and the created world. And so I, I, I don't know, does that sort of answer your question? I yeah. mean, the stories, we can, we can couch all of this in present-day cosmology, but I think that that's not going to answer a lot of the questions people have. And I think that that's not going to come to a deeper understanding of what Scripture's trying to teach and what we're learning through science. Just to clarify, when you talk about like rewriting the story, are you thinking of someone like Swim, Brian Swim? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not saying that what they're, doing, um, what they're doing is bad. I just don't want to see that replace um the 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 scriptural view of things because you know again it's you want to uh, the scientific views change i i do have in another talk i have a series of slides that show how even at the time of jesus the babylonian cosmology that is in genesis 1 that you were describing with the dome and the waters below and the waters above and the floodgates that were opened uh, when, when it rains. Well, if you've been in a plane before, you know that that's not how rain works, but people weren't on a plane 6,000 years ago. Um, so even at the time of Jesus uh, with Aristotle and other Greek philosophers, the cosmology had changed and people knew that and it didn't bother them back there, back then. It, it tends to, bother people now, um, and um, I'm not really sure why that is or why that should be. So I think better, better both scientific and theological education, I think, or, or what we need. I don't know, did, did that help? Does that Yeah, help? yeah, thank you very Answer much. Answer your question, thank you. Thank you. 
the question uh, will be um, about uh, the connections between uh, uh, science and religion. Um, with my knowledge, the science is proving that uh, all universe is working on relation. Um, it's like um, the atom have a nucleus and electrons around, uh, and that's the relation, and the sun and the planet around is a relation, uh, etc. And uh, uh, so uh, if the whole universe is working on relation, it's supposed to be the center of this relation. And uh, religion uh, is uh, uh, try to convince that the center of relation is a tree. Perfect relation between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's like imprint of the whole universe. Uh, the science is showing the whole relation, but is not showing any center scientifically of this relation. And my question is what uh, the science is pointing uh, as a center of relation? Well, I guess the way I would answer that question is that as far as, as we can probe in our universe, the universe started in a very simple state and has grown more complex through interactions over the past 13.8 billion years. Um, matter, space, and time as we know it um, had a very simple starting point um, scientifically, again, as we understand it today, in what we call the Big Bang, uh, back when the universe was so hot and so dense that individual particles really um, didn't even exist until the universe was about three minutes old. So I guess, I think in terms of, I, the, the universe evolves, and it evolves in complexity, from very, very simple beginnings. I don't know if you would refer to that as a center. Um, I, I don't think of things in terms of a center as much as, when I think of the universe, I like picture a neural network and all these interconnections of how things are related, um, how we're related to our cosmic origins, how the elements produced in stars billions of years ago are the elements that are in our bodies, um, that are in our physical makeup, um, and how all of these relationships uh, play out. So I don't know if that addresses your question or not, but again, I am not academically trained in philosophy or theology. I'm, I'm trained as a scientist. So uh, my lay understanding of theology is just that. It's a lay understanding. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether that answers your question or not, but... but. Uh, with connection, uh, religion and science uh, is answer, because if the God is the center of relation, everything to have a sense uh, of his crea creation is working on relation. But I'm sorry, I, I am having, I, I don't know whether it's the microphone or not, but I'm having a lot of difficulty hearing you up here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I... I cannot hear myself with this no, microphone. No <laughs> Over there. Uh, so if the, uh, when, when I understand the, uh, the Trinity is the center of relation, and I understand the creation scientifically working on relation, so that makes the sense for me. And uh, my question was uh, how the science explain this with, uh, when they don't prove in any center? of this of relation, so. It, so the, the history that we have sketched out for our universe, we've sketched out by evidence, basically looking back in time. We can study the past through the light that comes to us from things very, very far away. We can trace the way galaxies, for example, have developed over time. We can look to different places in our galaxy and see where new stars and planets 
are forming in the universe today. So we, we can investigate how our universe has developed over time from a very simple be beginning, from when space and time as we know it first started. And, and I don't know, I, I know you keep using the word uh, center of, and, and I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I understand that usage, at least not in a scientific context. I understand, uh, uh, like uh, when you look uh, through microscope, you see this, this very little objects like particles, atoms, and they work with relation. And so when you look through the telescope, you, you you see this. Uh, you, you see that on, on, all, on all different scales. You see things that are uh, interacting and interrelated. And you can't, you can't separate those interactions. Um, oh, that's right. That's when it's not so Excuse me. Maybe we can just take yeah. this conversation offline. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just in the interest of time, maybe one more question, and then we can break into the small okay. groups. Thank you. And thank perhaps you. Dr. Grace uh, Wolf Chase will be available privately. Yes. Right. Well, again, thank you for Hi. the presentation. And I apologize, this is actually a two part question. Um, <laughs> if you could maybe give the current thought on two different uh, related theories. One is um, basically the transition from organic molecules, which as you've described have been basically found yeah. everywhere, to life. How does that? transition? What's the current thought on how that yeah, transition so, takes place? So that, that's a great question, and there is not um, any one answer now. There are a number of people who are probing, who are chemists and biologists and experts in different fields that, of study than I am, that are actually doing um, simulations of like the early conditions in the early Earth and also exploring where other environments might be like that in space on, on other planets, um, and basically seeing what sorts of organic chemistry um, evolves. They're creating what you might call a synthetic life in the laboratory. Now, of course, we can never prove how life actually did, what the path that life actually took on Earth, but we could go through different um, organic chemical models to see how chemistry might have actually developed things like cell membranes and networks might have evolved to life. That is still very much a work in progress. Okay, thank you. And I guess yeah. my second one may end up with the same answer. I was going to ask what the latest current thought is on the idea of uh, basically we're Martians or such. The, the concept of life being able to survive space travel through, uh, you know, a collision of, of two planets creates a large asteroid which then goes and plants seeds of life on the next planet. Uh, I think it's sperm spermatology. Well, uh, oh, or, oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, can't, I can't remember <laughs> no, the ology I know what you mean. It, I can't remember, r remember the word for that uh, now either. Um, no, we don't think that happened. We think life got started on the Earth. I mean, that's not a definitive answer. Uh, but one of the things, of course, that we've been very careful with that we are worried about is sending, there are protected areas on Mars that might be most likely to still host some kind of at least subsurface extant life. Because um, there's a worry in sending people, in sending people to the moon, there wasn't a worry. The, the moon is a biologically dead world. Mars may not be. Um, so one of the things we don't want to do is contaminate other worlds that might have life developed separately. One, because of the ethical reasons for that, but also because that would erase any, tr it, would, it, would, it would murky the waters as far as, well, was there life here? Did life develop here or did we bring it there? So that's, thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Grace Wolf. Thank you. I would just highly recommend uh, any and all of the books she put up there uh, for reference. Really great ways of getting into the faith science dialogue. So again, those of you who will be uh, gathering for small faith group discussions, and I'd highly recommend you to consider that if you weren't planning on it. Uh, back in the lobby, uh, seminarians will be there holding up signs to let you know what group you're in, and they'll take you to the meeting rooms.